and welcome to GameSack. We're talking about games that you can only get if you download them digitally. You can't get a physical copy to hold in your hand. But these are games that we want a physical copy to hold in our hand. Yeah, and the reason for that is we just like, you know, if it's not connected to the internet, if the hard drive dies, you know, things like that, you can still play these games. Yeah, and these are games that we spent between 5 and up to $20 on, and we'd gladly do that again just to get a physical copy. Yeah, just like I did with Retro City Rampage on the PS4 and the, what are you doing? Let me see it. Dude, give that back. Anyway, we've got, we've got a lot of games that we want to show you that we feel that should get a physical release. Dude. Give that back. I'll give that back. I don't have anything. Afterburner Climax is an awesome game on the PS3 and the Xbox 360. It's based on the arcade game of the same name. We've talked about this one before and it's arcadey good fun for sure. You fly a plane around and you blow the crap out of everything. You're clearly the only good guy around and everyone else is bad so it's A-OK -okay to shoot them all down. Sometimes you even get to choose where to go. It really doesn't matter where you are, even if you're over cities, battling is just fine. I mean, I'm sure the people below won't mind that as raining destroyed airplanes. There's also the climax attack where you slow down time and lock onto a bunch of enemies Panzer Dragoon style. Climaxing in real life while you do this is optional. This game was delisted from the 360 and PSN store, so you can't even get it digitally anymore. So yeah, it's a great game, but it's short and small, so I'd like to see something else packed on the disc with it. So why not the PS3 and 360 version of Daytona USA? Yeah, I know, this game was released twice on the Saturn and once on the Dreamcast, so I can't say that it desperately needs a physical release. But this version here is the arcade version, and the resolution was increased to 1080p. Also, the aspect ratio was widened to 16x9, and it looks great, all things considered. The sound is a little odd, as it's tough to hear your crew calling over the radio, but the announcer can be heard just fine. This version would be great to have on a physical release. So what other Sega games should be released physically? Well, how about every single one of the Sega 3D Classics games on the 3DS? There's tons of games in the series like Space Harrier, Super Hang-On, Fantasy Zone, Sonic the Hedgehog, Streets of Rage, Galaxy Force 2, Outrun, it goes on and on and on with more to come. Now normally these games are identical to their Genesis or arcade counterparts with a really cool 3D effect added. But there are more options added to these games regarding how you play them and how you view them and all sorts of other things. Some games like Outrun here feature a faster frame rate, but honestly it's not quite as noticeable here as it is on the Saturn. But everything is still really fun, and it's great to play the arcade version of Super Hang-On on a home system. It's also nice to finally get a perfect port of Thunderblade. This is a cool helicopter game that features overhead and into the screen action. I always loved how you could go up and down in the overhead screens, it's just so fun. The control here kind of takes a while to get used to though. By the way, I hate the analog nub on the new 3DS. It sucks! It's not even a real stick, just a touch sensitive piece of crap. In this game you use it for the throttle. Still, I'd love to see this on an actual 3DS card. Yeah, I know these have been released physically in Japan, and they've even included the Master System versions of Space Harrier and Outrun, which is really cool by the way. But I am not buying a Japanese 3DS just to play them. They need to be released here in physical form. What the hell is wrong with you, Sega? In 2009, Konami did an amazing thing. They released three new digital-only titles of their best properties only on Nintendo's WiiWare. Take that, Joe! The first of these titles was Gradius Rebirth. This is a great game and is more or less a compilation of levels from the series, but each one feels fairly new and fresh. I like the new ideas on some of the old enemies, like these Moai heads rotating around here. The majority of the bosses are the same, so you'll have no problem with their patterns when you fight them. As is normal with Gradius, once you get your ship powered up, you're almost invincible. I say almost. After you die, you'll have a hell of a time getting yourself going again, but it can be done. The graphics are great, and I like the artwork as always. Gradius has some amazing tunes as it is, and they've been rearranged for this game and sound pretty damn good. Next is Contra Rebirth. 
This game is a mix of old and new as you'll see ideas and level designs from previous games as well as some new stuff. Old stuff like this level from Contra 3 and new stuff like the damn robot camel caravan. I freaking hate this level as it's stupid hard and the mid boss has a lot of attacks that are really hard to dodge. Other than that, this game is really fun and controls nicely. It uses a weapon system from Contra 3 where you can have two weapons and switch between them on the fly. This is great as I like to save certain weapons for certain parts of a level. Graphically, the game looks nice, but I feel that there's too much crap flying around the screen most of the time, which makes it really hard to see enemy bullets. This causes a lot of deaths that could have been preventable. The soundtrack again is a nice rearrangement of tunes we all know and love. And finally, my favorite game in the series. This is Castlevania The Adventure Rebirth. Why they chose the adventure from the Game Boy is beyond me. Don't get me wrong because I dearly love that game. As you play this game, you don't really feel much of a resemblance to it other than some familiar enemies. Maybe four or five of them, but that's it. The levels for the most part are all new. You do collect crystals to power up your whip, so I guess that's one more thing like the original game. The music is an arrangement of tunes from all over the Castlevania universe. I enjoyed each and every track in here and I would love to get a copy of the OST. Since these games were released only on the Wii, a lot of people never got to experience them. I feel that Konami should do the right thing and put all these games on a disc for the Wii U. But then again, this is Konami we're talking about and they'll just put them on your mobile phone instead. This is Lost Winds for the Wii. It was released in 2008, which was two years after the launch of the system. This is an action platformer, and it uses a fair amount of waggle control for the jumping technique. You use your nunchuck to control your character's movement. With the Wii remote, you swipe it under your character to make them jump. You can swipe three times, and then you have to land on the ground to use that technique again. It's not a perfect system, but it was innovative at the time and still works well enough in my opinion. I mean, what game out there with motion controls actually feels great? Uh, Metroid Prime 3? Alright Joe, I'll give you that one. That's one example, but this one is still completely playable. Yeah, there will be plenty of times when you feel like the motion controls are broken, but you keep on plugging away and make your way through the game. I really like the atmosphere. It has great graphics with lots of lush scenery. It's loaded with fun platforming, puzzles, and items to collect. The only real downfall is that the game can be beaten in around 3 hours. Yeah, I know it's not a very deep experience, but hold on because the game does have a sequel. Lost Winds 2 Winner of Melodious was released in 2009. This is a great sequel because it plays very similar to the first game and adds just enough to give it that fresh feel. The game still does have waggle controls, which is fine. The cool thing here is that the background will change at some point during the game. You start off playing a level completely frozen in ice and eventually it gets thawed out and you play the same area in a nice lush green world. There's a lot of backtracking, so it's at least nice to see different seasons as you're making your way through the game. A new addition to this one is a map that tells you where you need to go if you get lost. It's a welcome addition and gives it more depth than the first game offered. The music in both of these games is very nice and adds some great ambience to the world you're playing through. I really feel that this was supposed to be a trilogy of games, but I couldn't find any information on that. It'd be really cool if both games were given a physical release. I'm not sure how that would happen since the use of the Wii Remote's waggle feature is necessary to play and the Wii's pretty much dead now. All I know is that it should have happened a long time ago. Or how about Scott Pilgrim vs. The World The Game? This 2010 beat-em-up was a PS3 exclusive for 15 whole days before it appeared on the Xbox 360. Man, am I ever glad that I chose the PS3. Well, actually I have them both, so whatever. This came out at around the same time as the movie, which is based on the comic book. You're fighting off all of your girlfriend's ex-boyfriends to win her love or some such nonsense. Man, no girl is worth this. He's got to get out of this relationship while he still can. Aesthetically, the game looks more like the comic and not the movie, thankfully. It has that pseudo-retro look going for it as well. As a beat-em-up, it's pretty damn fun. Up to four players locally can play at the same time and you level each character up as you play. So suffice it to say, it's pretty damn tough when you begin. There's some River City Ransom style shops where you can up your stats as well. In fact, all those coins that are dropped by defeated enemies, you spend them here. 
The action isn't perfect, but is definitely playable and fun. Sometimes it seems like it's hard to make contact with an enemy, and other times it's hard to get away as they're pounding on you. You have two different attack buttons, a jump and a block. You can also do special moves if you have enough gut points. These can also revive you if you get knocked out. You've even got a Mario-style overworld map where you can select your level once they've been unlocked. I do like the graphics even though they look kind of rough and jaggy even for a retro style. I like the multiple layers of scrolling and all the enemies that can be on screen at once. The music was done by a band called Anamanaguchi and it's really awesome. In fact, I highly recommend unlocking the sound test so you can record it onto your computer and then just listen to it anytime you want. Go to GameFAQs.com to figure out how to do that. There's also some add-on DLC stuff, but I never bothered. A physical release should have it all, though. It's been a long time since I played through this one, but coming back to it now, I feel that it held up well and it's still a fun game. Yes, Joe, we've got a great start so far, and I totally agree that every one of the games that I talked about and you do need a physical copy, just like this one right here. Yeah, and that's mine, by the way. Yeah. Anyway, we've got more games to show you, so just hang on and hey, let's your mom get to it. If ever I wanted a game to get a hard copy, it definitely would be Shovel Knight. This game was released in June 2014 for 3DS, Wii U, and Windows. I bought the 3DS version at the time thinking it would be a great handheld title and I wasn't wrong. I played it a lot and was truly amazed at the 3D effect on the 3DS. Since we have a hard time recording footage of 3DS, I decided to purchase a game again for my PS4 so we could get some quality video. It might seem weird buying a digital copy twice, but I love the game so much I didn't think twice about it. Hell, if it does ever get a physical release, I'll be buying it a third time. I'm just amazed at the quality of this title. While I was playing, I could really feel the influence it draws from previous games like Castlevania with secrets hidden behind walls. This game actually has way more secrets than all the Castlevania games combined. In every level, you'll find many walls to break to find hidden gems and treasures. DuckTales is another game that I was reminded of when playing. Shovel Knight has a downward thrust with his shovel, and he can pogo on enemies just like Uncle Scrooge. And of course, this game has some really difficult platforming that reminds me a bit of the Mega Man series. And look at the map here, it screams Mario 3! Even with these influences, the game stands on its own merits and Shovel Knight is an amazing hero that is very likable and fun to play. Definitely collect all the gems that you can find because you're gonna need them. Everything costs money from buying sub weapons, food that'll increase your life bar, and potions that'll increase your magic. Well, it's not really magic, but it's what's used up when you use a sub weapon. The levels are all beautiful, highly detailed, and full of rich colors. And the music is outstanding. I simply cannot get these tunes out of my head and I don't want to. Please do yourself a favor and treat yourself to this game if you haven't played it. If you have played it, then you know what I'm talking about when I say it's awesome. And Yacht Club, if you're watching little old GameSec, please give this game a physical release and make a sequel. Dave talked about Contra Rebirth, well how about Hardcore Uprising on the PS3 and the Xbox 360? This is absolutely 100% a Contra game despite not having Contra in the title for some stupid ass reason. It's a prequel to Hardcore on the Genesis and even the original Contra. This one was made by Arc System Works, the makers of the Guilty Gear games and that means the animation is awesome. It's a good thing that the game itself also kicks ass. It starts out pretty tough, even though you have a life meter, which isn't usually the case for a Contra game. You have two characters to choose from, a boy and a girl. They both control the same, it's just a matter of one has a penis and the other, I, I hope she doesn't. But honestly, the real meat of the game lies in the uprising mode where you can earn CP, which is money I guess. You can use this to buy lots of really cool features like not having to worry about leveling up your weapons when you get them, having more life bars, and having 30 lives to begin with. It takes a long time to earn the money to buy all this stuff, and it can be kind of grindy, but it's worth it. Gameplay-wise, it's absolutely Contra. In fact, this is probably one of my favorite Contra games ever. Grinding to earn money also forces you to learn the stages really well, so you can get really good at this game even if you kind of suck at games like this. Each stage is extremely long with lots of variety and multiple bosses. 
My least favorite stage is probably this one with the force scrolling, but come on, it's still fun and full of craziness. And it even has a Gradius style boss. There's also a part in the game where you need to escort someone to safety and you can't let them die in the process. It's different, but it's still fun though. The graphics and the animation are both amazing and I love the 2.5D style here. It all meshes together really well, unlike a lot of 2.5D games. The music is fantastic with many Contra motifs all done heavy metal style. Honestly, I think this game would have sold better had they put Contra in the title, but hey, what the hell do I know? But I think that is absolutely criminal that this game wasn't released on disc to begin with. But then again, Konami is pretty damn stupid, so it's no wonder that this one was never marketed to its potential. It's an amazing game, check it out. This is Fez on the PS4. It's also available just about everywhere else, except for your phone. I'm not gonna talk much about how designer Phil Fish is a complete jerk and blames everybody but himself for his problems. I understand that creating a video game is not an easy task and can be completely frustrating, but you don't lash out at your fans since they're the ones giving you your money. So let's talk about what an amazing experience this game is and not think one bit about Phil Fish as I play this game. The game starts out on a 2D plane as you make your way to the top of the first level. I'm sitting here thinking, there's nothing special going on here. What's, what is this? It feels like any other 2D game with a retro style. But once I got to the top, oh man, did things change. After a short cutscene, you actually start the game over again and everything still looks 2D, but now you can rotate the play field. You now have four sides of the game screen, whereas you only had one side before. As you would guess, this makes for some very interesting puzzles and gameplay. Like here, when you can't possibly reach this platform over here, a platformer you couldn't possibly reach before is now an easy jump away. It feels so good rotating the game board and finding a secret door or finding a way to get higher or to a far off ledge that you just don't want it to stop. So the goal of the game is to collect these cube pieces. You need to collect them all or the world will collapse. Damn, that sounds scary. The game starts out easy enough and most of the puzzles aren't hard to figure out. As you progress though, things do get harder and you'll find warp gates and doors that will bring you to different planes. It gets really tough figuring out where you're going and where you've been. Yes, there's a map here, but it's not the easiest map to follow. Speaking of maps, take a look at these treasure maps. Um, yeah, what is this supposed to be? I have no idea what I'm looking at, and it doesn't resemble anything that I've seen so far from what I can tell. Other than the maps, this game is great. There's no enemies to fight, and if you fall from a high place, you die, but you're not punished for it, and you just reappear where you fell off. The music is different, and it's more ambient sounds than anything. I actually really like it, and it fits the game's mood. This is a really fun game, and I know there's zero chance of it getting a physical release, but I can always hope. Let's look at Dead Nation on the PlayStation 3. I think I got this one free back in the great PlayStation identity theft crisis of 2011. As a result of the hack, they gave away some free games to customers, and this was one of them. I downloaded it, but I never got around to trying it until recently. Wow, I should have played this one a lot sooner. It's awesome. Almost everyone but you has turned into a zombie, and now you've got to do what you've got to do. You can't be turned into a zombie, but they can still kill you dead. This is a twin stick shooter where one stick moves and the other one aims. The R1 button fires whatever weapon you happen to have selected. Your basic weapon is a rifle and it has unlimited ammo just like all rifles. You also have a melee attack if you're close and that's pretty useful. Whenever you kill a zombie you collect all of its cash and each and every zombie has a bunch of it. They also hide even more of their cash in the trunks of cars so be sure to check them all. Needless to say the zombie economy is booming and you're here to wreck it all. How do you spend this newly acquired cash? Well, at most checkpoints, there's a weapon shop where you can buy new weapons or upgrade the ones you have. You can also change out different pieces of armor if you found any. As you progress, more and more different types of weapons will be made available. At its heart, the game is a full-on action shooter, but between levels, they do try to wedge in some story so that you can remain emotionally invested in your character's gripping saga. Sometimes the game can be pretty tough, mainly because everything is so small. It's often tough to see what the hell is going on. Still, I like the look of everything, especially when the screen gets really crowded with lots of different types of zombies. But that's also usually when you die. The music is nice and intense, but there doesn't seem to be a whole heck of a lot of it. This is definitely a recommended game that you'll never ever be able to acquire if Sony goes out of business because it doesn't physically exist. So I hope you already have it.
Here's Axiom Verge on the PS4, and what a fun game this is. If you like Metroid at all, you will love this game. As you can see, it pretty much borrows level design completely from the Metroid series. That's fine by me because I really like that style of gameplay. As you're playing, you'll only be able to access certain areas until you power up your weapon or learn a new ability, and then you can open up new areas. This, of course, will lead you to traverse the game's map quite a bit. Luckily, everything is nice to look at, so it's not a problem going back and forth. I really like the graphical style and use of colors. A lot of things I look at and wonder what the hell is happening here. Like this massive mound of bodies. What are they doing here and will I become one of them when I die? Nope. I'm luckier than those poor souls because I just regenerated at the last save point. I guess they didn't know about save points. <laughs> Stupid asses. There's a lot of cool weapons and I guess peripherals you'll find as you're making your way through the game. Things like this drill which can only break certain rocks and those of course will open up new areas or a hidden secret. Another cool item is this address disruptor. If you see a glitch in the background, then shoot it because it'll solidify into a platform. Or you can use it on enemies to disrupt them and this will usually make them weaker. There's enough going on here that you won't feel like you're playing a blatant ripoff of Metroid. The game has a great atmosphere to it and it's only enhanced by the soundtrack which is really enjoyable. I wonder where I can get my hands on a copy of it. I've only just broken the surface of this game and I want to uncover all it has to offer. All I know is that if this game actually got a physical release, I'd be all over it. It's indie games like this that really give me hope in the future of gaming. If you've been on the fence about getting this game, just do it. $20 isn't a bad deal for a game of this quality. And there you go, those are some digitally distributed games that we feel deserve a physical release. So let us know what digital games that you feel should be released physically. Yeah, please do, because there's games out there that I wanna buy that are digital only, but you know, if I buy them, they're not mine. I mean, they are mine, but they're not mine because they're not Dude, like this. this is mine. <laughs> I'm not gonna let you keep this. I'll give you 20 bucks. No. 21. No. 21. 50. No. 2175! You're yourself, you freak! Oh, I'm just gonna steal this it later. Mine. Yeah, when you're sleeping, I'll get it. Yeah, I don't think so. Anyway, let us know, and thank you for watching GameSec. Dear Mr. Fish, I would like to take a moment of your time and tell you what a great joy I had experiencing your game Fez. From the moment I turned the game on, I was completely turned on myself. I've never felt this way playing a video game before and it's all thanks to you. You are so talented and I just want to let you know I am your number one fan. I have only one question, have you ever considered making a physical copy of this game? I'm sure it would sell a bazillion copies. Sincerely, David White. Phil Magazine. Phil Fish responded! Dear Mr. White, I know exactly what you're trying to do here and I will not refund a penny of your money. You have no clue how hard it is to make a game from the ground up and I wish you, you would just die! Kill yourself, please! Eat me! Sincerely, Phil!